it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Navy Seals versus the Horrors of Toxic Masculinity Lake. You want to take this one, Chief? Ah, oh, shit, Paul. I took the last one. It's your turn now. Paul, the big, bearded, muscular man with thighs the size of sequoias, was lounging on the beach chair, staring out at the lake, wearing an old, faded pair of cut-off uniform trousers, which he was using as swimming trunks. Paul set his bottle of Bud Light on the round glass table beside him, and casually reached down and scooped up his M39 enhanced marksman rifle. Pushing his Oakleys up onto his forehead, he put the scope to his eyes and pointed the rifle out towards the lake. Call it, Chief, he said casually. His buddy, Corey, who was equally lean, tanned and muscular, and who sported what he lovingly called his sexy porn stash, was laying on a padded lounge chair next to Paul. He was also sporting an old cut-off pair of camouflage trousers and holding a fold-out sun reflector under his chin. He lowered it briefly and looked out over the water. 175 meters, said Corey, before lazily lifting the sun reflector again. Yep, that looks about right, replied Paul as he squeezed the trigger. A sharp crack echoing across the lake and frightening a flock of white herons to take flight. The head of the demon clown slowly rising from the lake abruptly snapped backwards, a surprised look appearing on demon clown's face as it fell backwards into the lake, its arms splayed out, mouth filled with razors open wide in shock. Six blood-red balloons escaped from its clawed grasp and floated away before popping, each dumping a bucket of blood into the golden-colored waters. Wow, I still can't believe they didn't charge us extra when we rented this cabin, said the athletic black man with the chiseled chin, close-cropped haircut, flat top, and pencil-thin beard. He was carrying a platter of fat hot dogs and thick burgers fresh from the grill to set it down on a larger round glass table next to Corey, a tall beach umbrella poking up from a hole in the middle of the table. Hey, thanks, Darren, said Corey, reaching over and grabbing one of Darren's famous one-third pound burgers. Taking off a chef's apron which read, I got guns and shit, and revealing washboard abs, Darren grabbed a hot dog for himself and leaned back on an empty beach chair. Well, I have to admit, he said, munching on the delicious hot dog piled high with relish, mustard, and jalapenos. Initially, I was a bit hesitant when Lieutenant Wolf suggested we spend our four day Memorial Day holiday at a place called Moon Lake, but it's been pretty sweet so far. Hey, I heard a shot, said a tall man with short, dirty blonde hair and an Olympic swimmer's body as he emerged from the sliding side door of the impressively large lakeside cabin, a bucket filled with bottles of Coronas on ice in one hand and a tray with cans of Coke and a bottle of Blanton's bourbon and Diplomatico Ambassador rum in the other. Walking down to the dock, he set the libations down and said, What is it this time? Well, I look like a demon clown said Corey. Hey, can you pass me one, sir? The tall man reached into the ice and tossed a cold corona to Corey, then poured a bourbon and coke for himself, before taking the last empty seat on the dock which overlooked the lake. Ah, uh, demon clown, you say? That one was early today. It's not even noon. He took a small sip of his drink, smiling as he got comfortable in his chair. Here you go, Lieutenant, said Darren, Proudly passing a cheeseburger grilled the way he knew the officer liked it. Well done. Thin slices of avocado, topped with a hard-boiled egg. Thanks, Darren, replied the lieutenant. How'd you learn to grill like this? Well, since arriving at the cabin a day and a half ago, Petty Officer Darren Hillard had insisted on doing the cooking, having nearly bought out the local grocery store of meats, seasonings, and vegetables before they arrived at this secluded lake. Well, I was the eldest of five, sir, so growing up I had to learn to cook before I even went to middle school, said Darren, leaning back again, arms folded behind his neck as he enjoyed the balmy rays of sun. That's why I originally joined the military, to be a Navy chef before I decided to become a Navy SEAL. Really? said Jake Wolf, their well-liked and well-respected lieutenant, 
who had planned this short Memorial Day trip as a brief but well-deserved getaway for him and his senior NCOs. I figured that being a chef would be the last thing you wanted to do in the Navy after cooking your whole life. Ah, oh, no, sir, smiled Darren. You see, after I fed my younger sister and the two twins, there was almost no food left over for me. Well, I became a cook because I was starving. The four erupted in laughter, as Lieutenant Wolf said. You did not, you dumbass. Oh, your mom's already spilled the beans that you're going to play for the Los Angeles Rams after your stint in the Navy. Hey, sir, said Big Petty Officer First Class Paul Gamesby. Out of all the places we could have gone to spend this weekend, why did you choose to bring us to a near-abandoned lake all the way out in Utah? Well, the weather was a clear and balmy 86 degrees, and the May sun shone down on the surrounding mountains, which flourished in every single shade of green and the crystal-clear golden-blue waters of Moon Lake. The rustic-looking log cabin in which the four Navy SEALs were staying was large and very spacious, with a very well-stocked and apportioned kitchen, a living room with a wraparound leather sofa facing a theatre-sized wall-mounted television, and four bedrooms each containing a king-sized bed. The cabin was located at the northwestern edge of Moon Lake, miles from where the visitors usually camped in the southeastern end, and came complete with a stone patio and a fire pit which led down to a connected dock which jutted out over the lake itself. Well, for such a luxurious place, a log cabin could only be accessed once they turned down off the barely paved road and onto a narrow twisting dirt road which led miles into the wilderness. Lieutenant Wolf leaned back, enjoying the breathtaking view of the wild, unspoiled mountains surrounding the placid lake. Well, he said, Believe it or not, I practically got this cabin for free. Seems that not too many folks come out here to camp and fish, even during the holidays. Anyway, I figure this would be as good a place as any to blow off some steam after what we'd experienced in Afghanistan and Fiery Cross Reef. I have a feeling the shit's going to hit the fan again when we get back to Coronado. He took another sip of his bourbon and coke. Sometimes... You just have to get away and find some secluded place where you can sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen to the sounds of peace and quiet. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! whispered the raspy, high-pitched voice. A pale, clawed hand slowly let go of the leafy branch and it snapped back into place, obscuring the view of the four men whom they'd been observing from across the lake. I thought that demon clown would have killed them, gutted them like a fish. Ma, whispered a reptilian hissing voice from behind. Demon clown was highly overrated, using fear to store children, just like that pathetic burn man with that stupid hat and ratty sweater who wore that metal knife glove. Demon clown was hardly any better than the one who bragged he would eviscerate them the night those four came to the lake. You know, the tall, stinky, drowned one with the hockey mask and the machete, who always had a problem with campers having unsafe sex. Came a third, deep and hollow voice, sounding more like a roar than spoken words. But by the time they were through with that guy, there wasn't enough left of him to take to his mother. Who the hell do you think you're fooling, rancid fur? snarled the first voice. His mama didn't get his remains because you ate what was left of Mr. Voorhees. Ah, oh, she got his hockey mask, came the growling response. If you call me rancid fur one more time, I swear I'll squeeze your skinny little pencil neck until your head pops off. Enough, boomed a fourth voice, so loudly that a flock of perching blackbirds scrambled out of the trees above them, a brief cacophony of caws filling the air as the birds flew to a more peaceful side of the lake. Enough came the demonic voice again, softer this time so as not to be heard by the four strangers lounging on the other side of the lake, mockingly, as if they had no fear of the terrors which surrounded them. The master has placed us on this realm to make cowards of men, to fill their hearts with fear and terror and panic, and to turn their knees to jelly. We exist to instill foreboding and doubt so that men will melt like snowflakes and run in search of safe places instead of standing defiantly and opposing the will of our master. The presence of those four here will be a problem. 
They must not be allowed to leave the lake. I'll leave it to me, hissed the reptilian voice. Men are courageous when they're on land. In the water, however, even the bravest men become quivering cowards. And those four will be no exception. Hey, did you see that? said Paul nonchalantly, as the flock of startled blackbirds suddenly took to the air from across the lake. How long do you reckon they've been watching us? Uh, they've probably been observing us for a while now, answered Jake, at least for the past hour or so. I reckon that only the ones that can be out in the daylight are there, added Chief Petty Officer Corey Pretty, as he got up from his lounge chair and stretched. I'm going to go grab the fishing poles. Go on, Darren. Let's see what we can catch for dinner. <laughs> yep, have fun, said Jake. Hey, Paul, you up for a little hunting? He was looking in the direction of where the blackbirds had suddenly taken flight. Yeah, man, said Paul, grabbing up his rifle. The owner of the cabin also owned a good-sized bass boat and offered to allow the seals to use it without extra cost. Corey and Darren were in the boat out in the middle of the lake, floating lazily atop the clear still waters and enjoying the view. The fish were big and they were biting, so much so that anything they reeled in that was less than two feet long they threw back into the lake. Even so, their cooler was filling up quickly with large lake trout, rainbow trout, and even nice-sized large white bass. Neither of them noticed when something slipped into the water from the opposite shore, an almost imperceptible wake leading towards the bass boat. My grandfather had the greatest recipe for battered deep-fried catfish, said Darren as he tossed a small walleye back into the water. He had this secret recipe for the batter, and he used to tell me that the only way he cook catfish is directly from the boat to the deep fryer. Oh, I wonder if there are any catfish in this lake. Only one way to find out, said Corey, pulling out a plastic bag from the tackle box and opening it. Oh, good lord, chief, exclaimed Aaron. What is that? It smells atrocious. A stink bait, laughed Corey. Best way to attract catfish since they have an extraordinary sense of smell. My grandfather taught me to make this vile concoction when we used to go catfish fishing back in Akron soaking a sponge in the pungent conglomeration of stinky, soured materials. Corey tossed it into the water. Well, this will attract the catfish for miles, he said, pointing out to where he'd tossed the sponge. Drop your line in there, Darren. Darren tossed his line, which landed with a soft bop into the water. He didn't have to wait long until the end of his pole bent and the reel squeezed. Whoa, got one, chief. Ah, it's a big one. Darren yanked back on his pole, gently easing up on the tension so that the line didn't snap. That ah, works every time, said Corey, reeling in his own line to replace the bait with crawfish to join Darren in catching the catfish. Darren's reel continued squealing as more line was dragged out, but the line held as he steadily began reeling it in. Well, this one has to be at least 15 pounds, Chief. Don't let it get away, man. Your granddad will get mad at you. All of a sudden, Darren's pole bent almost in half, as if something even bigger had taken a bite out of his catch. The pole then straightened, the struggling of the catch suddenly stopping. Darren reeled in the line and held it up. Sure enough, it was a channel catfish, easily in the 20-pound range, had it all been there. But the entire body behind the head had been eaten away in one bite. A dark green-brown shape was rapidly emerging from the water, like a missile towards the bass boat. Oh, chief, we're about to have company, warned Darren. The Loveland frog leapt out of the water, the legendary amphibian-like creature's arms outstretched and webbed claws grasping. Bulging yellow eyes glared angrily at the two Navy Seals from a bulbous, triangular head, more open, revealing tiny, needle-sharp teeth. The horrific frog monster's body was met by multiple gunshots from Corey's MK-12 special purpose rifle and Darren's MEU combat pistol. The thunderous impact of both weapons hitting its head and upper body, flipping the Loveland frog over as it splashed face down into the water. Legs and arms spread wide, just feet from the boat, 
and sinking unceremoniously back into the lake. Well, that one wasn't nearly as scary as the last ones we encountered, said Darren. Yep, yeah, definitely, agreed Corey. This one wasn't even five feet tall. Well, stank like hell, though. Still, want to try for a few catfish? Sure, replied Darren. Jake and Paul walked side by side through the woods. Jake having changed into a comfortable pair of jeans, combat boots and a tan t-shirt, over which he wore his tan and brown modular combat vest, festooned with pouches of ammunition magazines, oak leaves over his eyes and a blue LA Dodgers ball cap on his head. An MK-14 enhanced battle rifle was in his hands, held at the high ready position. Paul still had on his cut-off uniform pants and was topless save for the modular combat vest he wore, his enhanced battle rifle looking like a stick in his muscular grip. Both had six-hour combat pistols on thigh holsters strapped to their right leg. The pair had made their way leisurely around the lake for the last hour, working their way towards the south with the lake to their left, beyond the forest and trees. Along the way, they encountered a few bucks and even spotted a mother black bear nudging her cubs up the side of one of the mountain trails. But these were not the game that the two men were hunting for, and they left the animals unmolested. They stopped when they heard the weapons discharge coming from the lake, followed by a large splash. On Jake's signal, they both slowly took a knee, weapons pointing out. In a few seconds, they heard the sounds of Corey and Darren's laughing as it echoed across the lake in the distance. Jake slowly stood again and turned to Paul, who simply shrugged. They continued on for a few more minutes before they both stopped in unison and once again took a knee. The peaceful and cheerful sounds of nature bathing under a warm late spring sun went completely silent, the place with the putrid smell of rot and decay suddenly filling the air. The trees were reasonably spaced out, and the two seals were kneeling at the edge of a shallow clearing. I got movement, sir, whispered Paul. Seventy-five meters to your five o'clock. They were kneeling back to back, covering each other's six, when Jake looked over his shoulder, keeping his weapon pointed straight ahead. Something inhumanly large and hairy was staring at them from beyond a close cluster of fir trees. Taking a quick look to ensure that no one would be behind them, Jake shifted and turned, facing in the same direction as Paul, and pointed his rifle at the entity. Still in the kneeling position, Jake yelled, We can see you. Come out slowly. Take three steps to your right, away from the trees. The Bigfoot slowly stepped out into the open, the dark brown fur-covered entity easily standing eight feet tall, with shoulders that were broader than even Big Paul's. His giant simian fists were curled into a fist, small, Black, close-set eyes set under large, overhanging brows, staring angrily but uncertainly at the two Navy SEALs, pointing their high-powered weapons at him. You son of a bitch, came a high-pitched, raspy voice. A black shape suddenly appeared, as if out of thin air, right behind the Bigfoot. It was disturbingly humanoid in shape, standing ten feet tall and practically pencil-thin. The entity wore what appeared to be a formal black suit complete with white shirt and black tie, and its face was completely devoid of facial features. No eyes, no nose, no mouth, no hair. Nothing. Just a plain blank face. The creature was emanating some type of angry voice. You damn nauseating son of a bitch, screamed the slender man. Did it ever occur to you that the reason you can never sneak up upon humans is because you smell so revolting? Oh, damn you, rancid fur. The Bigfoot turned, roaring in anger as he throttled the slender man's long neck. I told you not to call me rancid fur. With a howl that echoed across the forest for miles, the Bigfoot squeezed slender man's neck with his left hand while running his right hand up his neck, popping the slender man's head right up. The slender man's body spasmed for a few seconds before finally slumping, still being held up in the Bigfoot's powerful grip. The Bigfoot tossed the slender man's corpse away with a disgusted grunt, but then turned to look back at the body as if reconsidering something. Mm, he can't taste any worse than that Voorhees idiot, Bigfoot thought as he bent over and threw the headless corpse over his shoulder. 
picking up Slenderman's head. He took a sniff of it before looking up and seeing the two men still kneeling at the edge of the clearing, still pointing their high-powered rifles at him. Oh, shit, the Bigfoot whispered in a deep, throaty voice. Slowly raising his massive hairy arms, the Bigfoot turned to the seals and bellowed in a voice that sounded more like a low growl. Oh, look, fellas, I'm not a part of this. I just came here to see what was up. Thought it might be cool to finally hang out with these guys. And they just turned out to be complete assholes. Especially the werewolf. Yeah, watch out for that guy. Total jerk, believe me. The Bigfoot lowered his hands and pointed over his shoulder with his thumb. Look, I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna take the Slim Jim here and... Uh... And at that, the Bigfoot turned and bolted into the forest carrying the remains of Slender Man with him as he disappeared into the trees. Darren, you've outdone yourself, said Jake. This has to be the best deep-fried catfish I've ever had. Your grandfather would be jealous. Darren walked around the fire pit, handing his lieutenant his favorite drink, two shots of Blanton's bourbon over ice and a splash of coke. I don't know, sir. My grandfather's homemade hot sauce had a lot more kick than the store brand we got. But I'm glad you liked it. The sun hadn't fully set yet, the sky still a blaze of dark purples and deep reds, as if it wasn't quite ready to surrender to the night as the four lounged around the brick fire pit. Corey was sipping a tumbler of his favorite drink, Diplomatico Ambassador Rum on Ice, while Paul was enjoying a Belvedere vodka and club soda with a twist of lime. Darren, who usually avoided liquor, satisfied himself with a cold Corona. Hey, sir, said Corey. I don't remember us bringing any of these when we came out here. What's that, chief? The liquor? Yeah. Well, said Jake, the folks that I rented this cabin from asked what we'd like waiting for us in the cooler when we got here. Just a little something extra which they left us free of charge. Well, that's certainly generous of them, sir, said Paul, seeing as they already let us use their boat and ATVs for no additional cost. Yep, you're right, answered Jake. But the gentleman whom I talked with said that visitors don't come out this way anymore, at least not like they did before, so he actually welcomed us out here, since he says the last paying guest to the cabin visited this place over five years ago. Five years, said Corey. Hey, Darren, remember when we almost bought out that whole local grocery store in town? Didn't the old lady who ran the place say that a bunch of people disappeared around Moon Lake five years ago? Yeah, Chief, said Darren, staring contentedly at the crackling fire. Yeah, she did say something like that. Something like nine or ten people during peak tourist season. They sat reclining around the crackling fire, listening to the crickets chirping and not in a hurry to move after such a hearty dinner. So that frog creature you two shot out on the lake, Jake finally said. Was it one of those things we encountered out at Fiery Cross Reef? Uh, it looked somewhat like it, but not really, said Corey. It wasn't as big, and it didn't have the dorsal spine or fishtail. Plus, it went down with just a few rounds, whereas Fiery Cross, we, well, had to put almost a half clip into one of those just to take it down. Did that Bigfoot thing really call the Slender Man a Slim Jim before he carried him away? Said Darren, chuckling. Well, I kid you not, man. After he popped the thing's head off its neck... Bigfoot gave a new meaning to the phrase snapping into a Slim Jim, laughed Paul. So, uh, you figure we can expect any company tonight again, sir? asked Corey. More than likely, said the lieutenant. We should get ready here shortly. He stared at his empty tumbler then. Well, maybe after another round. Ah, it was a good idea coming out here, said Paul. Yeah, agreed Dan. Yeah, it was. No movement, whispered Paul as he stared out the window through his thermal sights from inside his bedroom. It was well past dark and the light of the fire pit outside was fading like the ghost of smoking embers. Though all of the lights were shut off inside the cabin, as well as the outside porch and patio lights, there were still three lights which were on outside. One light was on a pole overlooking the dock. One light on a pole which illuminated the walkway leading to the dock, and one light which shone on the boathouse and generator shack that was providing power to the light poles. Okay, 
whispered Jake as he patted Paul on the shoulder. One more hour and we'll rotate. Jake had positioned Chief Corey in the living room and Darren in the kitchen, each with thermal night sights to observe their assigned sectors, while Jake stayed in the main hallway which connected all three areas. Every hour the plan was to have each seal shift positions so as not to get eye strain or be complacent in their vigil, a phenomenon known as a thousand yard stare. The most vulnerable area would be the front of the cabin, which faced out into the forest and had no illumination as all lights were shut off. Jake ordered that the porch light be switched off, the ambient light of the moon allowing for better night vision using their NVDs as opposed to the glare of a porch light that would inhibit the night vision devices from working. Near midnight, the lights at the end of the shed and the dock began to sputter on and off before finally going out, even though the generator could still be heard running normally. There came a thump on the roof, followed by a shuffling sound as if something was skittering above. It's coming down your way, Dan, whispered Jake into his earpiece. Something then leapt from the roof, landing effortlessly and silently on the grass in front of the kitchen window, slightly luminescent skin stretched over a skeletal form. It was humanoid in form, completely naked and sexless with a bald head, a hole where the nose should be and two small points of light glowing from the empty eye sockets. It crawled on all fours, looking in the kitchen as if trying to penetrate into the pitch black window. It stopped, seemed to stare at Darren who sat motionless behind the island in the kitchen, head resting on the stock of his rifle. The thing seemed to jump back slightly, then darted around to the side of the cabin. I see it. Looks like some kind of glow-in-the-dark ghoul, whispered Darren into his earpiece. I think it made me. It's coming around to you, Paul. Yep, I see it, said Paul from his bedroom, using his sturdy nightstand as the platform to rest his rifle on. It's scoping out this section of the cabin. Oh shit, looks like it spotted me. It's going around to the front. Realizing that the creature was nocturnal, which was how it could have seen Darren and Paul in almost pitched blackness, Jake sprinted to the front of the foyer of the cabin, hands on the switches to the lights outside. I can see in the dark, whispered Jake. It's scouting us out. Corey, you got this? Corey steadied his MK-12 rifle out of the large bay window, taking the weapon off safe. I'm on it, sir. As Jake anticipated, the creature came around the corner and crawled out of the forest cautiously, towards the cabin's main front entrance. The humans were fully awake and alert, and they were expecting unwelcome company. That was worrisome, but if anything could find a blind spot into these day-sided creatures dwelling, it'd be... The lights on the front porch and the light poles, which lined the stone pathway leading up to the front door, suddenly came on, flooding the immediate area with a brilliant white light, which instantly dispelled the darkness. The creature screeched in surprise, suddenly bathed in the radiant beams. Covering its eye sockets with clawed hands, it stumbled back blindly, just as a red dot appeared briefly between its eyes, followed a split second later by a loud ringing boom sound. The rake's headless form flopped backwards and rolled end over end before finally coming to a stop, lying in a heap on the forest floor. Beyond it, Leering yellow eyes stared out of the darkness of the forest, angrily staring at the cabin. With a high-pitched roar, the thing stepped out into the light. Darren! Paul! Get out here! yelled Jake. The seven-foot-tall goatman bleated with hatred and rage. Swinging a wicked-looking axe above its horned forehead, the goat-headed creature with the humanoid body and legs of a goat charged, its hooves clattering on the cobblestones leading to the brightly lit cabin. However, the lights which illuminated the cabin suddenly shut off, casting the area into almost complete blackness again. The far-sighted goatman, now temporarily blinded, tripped head over heels over a carefully in-place tripwire placed across the sidewalk and slammed face first into the cobblestone walkway. The cabin door suddenly burst open, Jake, Corey and Darren sprinting out and utilizing the night vision scopes on their battle rifles to relentlessly pepper the fallen Goldman with heavy velocity ball rounds until his body stopped quaking and lay still. Hey, where's Paul? yelled Jake. 
A loud crash coming from the bedroom area. I'm on it, Darren responded as he ducked back into the cabin. No sooner had Darren run back inside the cabin than a large form appeared out of the darkness, followed by a now familiar stench. Jake flipped on the porch lights again to reveal Bigfoot emerging from the trees, its hairy hands held up. Um, hey fellas. Bigfoot's deep, growling voice spoke. Don't shoot, I'm just here to, I mean, um, if you don't mind, I, um... Uh... Bigfoot pointed at the dead bodies of the goatmen and the rake. Jake and Corey nodded, dumbfounded, and Bigfoot bent over and hauled the two monsters over his massive shoulders. Thanks, fellas, said Bigfoot, as he bellowed a deep, guttural laugh. <laughs> you know, when they promised that I'd be eating good this weekend, I don't think they meant like this. Then once again, the Bigfoot melted into the forest, as if he was never there at all. Darren burst into Paul's bedroom to see the big Navy SEAL struggling with a hideous, human-looking monstrosity. The thing resembled the rake, only larger, with rotted flesh and an oversized mouth filled with fangs dripping with saliva. It wore a ragged black cloak and hood which barely concealed its green skeletal frame. Though Paul looked physically bigger and was far more muscular than his ghoulish adversary, Paul was having trouble overpowering it. What the hell? yelled Darren, bringing up his rifle but not having a clear shot as his teammate and the thing threw each other around the room, destroying lamps, mirrors and dresses. This fucking thing came out of the closet, grunted Paul, his hands clamped around the creature's wrists as he tried to keep his own face and neck away from the creature's biting jaws. Now the thing was steadily overpowering Paul, forcing the bodybuilding Navy SEAL to fall backwards onto the bed. The bogeyman's jaws unhinged and distended, its maw growing wider as its greedy eyes stared down at the big navy seal hungrily. However, that gave Darren the brief opening he needed to strike the bogeyman in the jaw with a wicked butt stroke from his rifle. More distracted than hurt, the bogeyman roared at Darren as Paul brought his tree trunk like legs under him and shoved the bogeyman against the wall with a powerful kick. Running up to Paul's side, Darren also pinned the bogeyman to the wall with one leg while simultaneously raising his battle rifle to the ghoul's head. Paul added six hour out of its holster as both navy seals fired round after round into the horrific creature's head. The bogeyman howled in protest, dissolving into a pile of ash as it died. Oh shit, said Paul, looking at the damage done to the bedroom caused by the struggle and the large hole he and Darren had just blasted into the wall. Ah, oh, the lieutenant's gonna choke murder me. The team was up bright and early the next morning, just as the sun began peeking over the smoking mountains. Corey and Paul were taking a brisk morning swim in the crystal clear lake, while Jake and Darren had decided to have a pleasant morning jog along the numerous trails surrounding the lake. Nothing too unusual occurred, apart from Jake and Darren encountering a sickly pale creature which resembled an unholy combination of a lizard and an extremely skinny coyote along a trail headed back to the cabin. The thing had no fur and a row of bony spines protruded from its back. Baring its teeth at Jake and Darren, the coyote-looking creature opened its jaws and produced two long fangs as its snake-like tongue licked its lips. It was about twenty meters up the trail as it stalked towards the two startled navy seals, the creature dropped dead in the middle of the trail from a few well-placed shots to the head from a pair of six-hour combat pistols. However, before Jake and Darren could walk up and identify the body of the demonic-looking creature, Bigfoot again emerged from the forest and walked onto the trail. Reaching down and throwing the carcass of the chupacabra over its shoulder, the Bigfoot licked its lips as it gave the two Navy Seals a big thumbs up before jumping back into the trees and disappearing into the forest. As for Corey and Paul... Again, nothing too unusual occurred during their morning swim, taking four laps across the lake and back. Well, other than, curiously, Corey had swum the entire two-mile distance completely underwater without surfacing once. He discovered that he could swim farther and faster underwater without any fatigue and without the use of any breathing apparatus ever since the team's last mission at Fiery Cross Reef. This was something he'd have to check into later on, but for now his orders had been to unwind and relax, 
and with this being the last day out on the lake before the team headed back to Coronado, Corey meant to make the most of it. Breakfast was served on the patio deck overlooking the lake, and Darren once again served up a hearty meal of made-to-order omelettes, scratch-made biscuits, cheese and pepper hash browns, sausage, orange juice, and a fresh pot of coffee. Well, since it was Sunday, the plan was to take the ATVs out onto the trails for a few hours of off-roading until around noon. With the NBA playoffs cancelled due to COVID, the team decided to spend the rest of the day fishing or watching movies. Okay, announced Jake. So Darren took out Hockey Mass Machete Campground Slasher on day one. No, sir, corrected Darren. I got the ball rolling when I hit him in the chest, but Chief got him to stop moving when he ventilated his face with a few 762 rounds. Okay, right, said Jake. So Chief got the campground slasher. Then Paul got Demon Clown as it rose from the lake. Did he do anything besides rise, Paul? I mean, did he do anything except monster pose? No, nah, sir, said Paul. All I did was scary Demon Clown monster pose. Yeah, that doesn't work on us, said Jake. Okay, then. After that, Corey and Darren took care of the frogman. Well, Paul and I saw Slenderman get lollipop by Bigfoot. Then last night, Corey ventilated the rake before me, Corey, and Darren sent the goat man to the great beyond. Well, then the bogeyman came out of the closet, and Paul and Darren gave it a full face of poo poo poo. Ha! said Paul. The bogeyman came out of the closet. Oh, he saw that ass, Gimpy, said Darren. Hey, this is America's ass right here, baby, laughed Paul. Don't forget the chupacabra. Yep, said Jake. Chupacabra this morning. Do you think the Bigfoot is going to be an issue? Asked Corey. Oh, he might, said Jake, finishing his orange juice. I'm not feeling it, though. He just may be along for the ride. I mean, I mean, when he came out of the woods to take the chupacabra's carcass, he reeked of marijuana. What? Said Paul in disbelief. No way, man. It's true, answered Darren. The big guy was higher than a Boeing 737 this morning when he came stumbling out of the woods. Oh, maybe that's why he's eating his buddies, said Corey. Bigfoot got the munchies. So, Bigfoot's a hippie? laughed the lieutenant. Oh, I don't know about that, sir, said Corey, scooping more cheese and pepper hash browns onto his plate and refilling his coffee mug. But if my granddaddy Sergeant First Class Pretty is to be believed, then... Bigfoot really hates commies, so probably not. Any bets on who's coming at us tonight? Said Jake. Bigfoot mentioned that the werewolf is some kind of asshole, so I'm figuring he'll show up sometime before we leave tomorrow. Zombies, dude, said Paul. There can't be a cabin out in these haunted woods and there not be zombies. Mothman, said Darren. Creepy ghost chick crawling out of the television. Hey, what about a skinwalk? Oh, that's the next story, said Corey. Huh? said Darren. What? <sighs> Never mind. Wendigo, said Darren. Canadian Special Ops, replied Corey. Wait for it. <laughs> oh, about the Loch Ness Monster, said Paul. Man, Gimsby, said the lieutenant. If the next one he can counter is the Loch Ness Monster, we're definitely dragging its ass back with us to Coronado. After breakfast, the team found all four brand new ATVs waiting for them in a garage, fully fueled and ready to go, and for the next few hours they spent the time getting the ATVs and themselves dirty and covered in mud. During their riotous romp through the forest in their big-wheeled ATVs, the seals encountered nothing out of the ordinary, except for a high-flying ropen which wisely decided to keep its distance when the prehistoric flying reptiles saw that the four big men had equally big battle rifles strapped to their back. The team drove their ATVs to the same local grocery store at the edge of town that Darren had practically bought out before the weekend started, and was greeted by the kindly elderly lady who ran the store with a surprised, My God, you folks are still alive. After telling the disbelieving old lady what a wonderful time they were having up at the cabin, Darren proceeded to buy the store out of their supply of tostada chips and ingredients for a variety of dipping sauces, while the chief and the lieutenant picked up the beer for their last night at the cabin, and Paul stocked up on the ammo. The team got back to the cabin, 
and Darren searched the programming on the theatre-sized television screen, which came equipped with all the sports channels from around the world. Darren found his favourite Bundesliga team, Hanover 96, playing Dortmund in the semi-finals as he prepared the chips and dips for later on. The LT and Chief were down at the shed, washing down the completely mud-encrusted ATVs, while Paul was reloading empty rifle magazines, oiling down bolt carrier groups and punching out rifle barrels with a generous application of break-free. Curiously, even though America was locked down, the team found no shortage of sporting events to watch from around the world. Rugby tournaments in London, cycling in France, ice hockey in Switzerland, World Championship Taekwondo in Denmark, and even the World Cup of Billiards in Vietnam. The team finally settled on soccer, and in truth, though the NBA and almost all professional sports in America was cancelled due to the COVID lockdown, the Seals seemed to enjoy the German Bundesliga soccer matches when the stadiums were still filled with cheering fans. The leisurely afternoon passed, which Darren and Corey capped off with some late afternoon fishing from the dock while Jake and Paul each decided to catch a nap. Dinner consisted of hearty cold-cut sandwiches and fresh fish, as the team packed for the trip back to their base in Coronado the next morning. An episode of American Ninja Warriors now playing on the television, which no one seemed to be watching. It was all well after midnight, when there came a clattering at the front door, along with the sound of females panic screaming, accompanied by desperate pounding at the door. Paul, who was camped out on the couch in the living room since his room was trashed the night before, was still up and watching reruns of the Golden Girls. He raced to the door and flung it open, battle rifle up and ready. Four attractive college-aged females stood shivering outside, all dressed in micro-short cut-off shorts and cut-off tops, and all wearing expressions of terror on their faces. As soon as the door opened, the girl closest to it, the tanned one with long, wavy blonde hair, full lips and light blue eyes, cut off blue jeans and wearing a cut off white t-shirt which barely contained her ample breasts, said, Oh, thank God, thank God, thank God. Please, said another girl behind her with an Irish accent, this one a busty, fiery redhead with green eyes, with cut off shorts and a pink halter top. We're trying to find our campsite when our van broke down. We tried finding our campsite in the dark, but... Oh my god! There's something out there, said another girl. A light-skinned black girl with long, silky brown hair and hoop earrings. There's something in the dark. Chased us across the road, said the first girl. Thank god we saw your light. Please, we don't know what it is, but it's right behind us. Please, sir, said the Asian girl with long, wavy black hair which seemed to reach down to curl around and lovingly caress her breasts. She stared and gulped at the massive rifle that Paul held across his equally massive chest. May we come in? We're frightened. Paul stepped back, looking out into the blackness behind the four lovely young females. Um, yeah. Sure. Corey, Jake and Darren suddenly appeared from their bedrooms, Battle rifles gripped in their hands as they leapt over the couch and ran towards the front door. No, wait, yelled Corey. Oh, shit, exclaimed Jake. As soon as a blonde girl entered the door, she leapt upon Paul, the slender young woman surprising the muscular Navy SEAL with her almost inhuman strength. As he toppled backwards into the cabin, the three other girls swiftly charged in behind, hideous shrieks emanating from their throats. The force of the blonde girl's lunge flipped the surprised Navy SEAL over, to the point where once they'd somersaulted and landed on the ground, Big Paul inadvertently finding himself straddling the girl and looking down at her. Hey! yelped Paul in embarrassment. Where did your clothes go? Equally surprised, the girl looked up at Paul, saying, You wouldn't hit a girl, would you? Wham! Well, Paul's fist slammed down on the blonde girl's face, even as she began to change into a horrific, fanged creature. How are you assigning gender traits now? Paul jumped back as a pale, clawed talon reached up to swipe at him. Grabbing up the battle rifle he dropped, Paul raised it quickly and began firing. 
By now, the three other girls had entered the cabin and completed the change into their true forms as their skin turned pale. Arms and legs extended into bony appendages, which ended in talons as leathery, bat-like wings extended from under their arms. Once luxurious long hair turned into an unkempt nest of shaggy black hair, and their faces had become a nightmarish amalgamation of a human and a bat. Their noses fat and flat, eyes black, ears long and spiked, and mouths wide and filled with needle fangs. They were naked, covered in coarse fur, and their legs were inverted like those of a bat, and they swooped down upon the startled Navy Seal's talons outstretched and moors salivating with anticipation of the coming blood feast. Darren was at the rear, and at a split second to raise his rifle and quick snap around into the vampire which was diving on the lieutenant, missing the back of his head by a foot. The high-velocity 762 round sipped past the lieutenant's ear and slammed face first into the vampire, causing it to tumble mid-air and backwards into the vampire behind. Ignoring the close call, Jake lifted his rifle and pointed it at the vampire which had descended on Corey. Somehow, Despite all of its inhuman strength, Corey had the vampire by the throat, having caught it in mid-air and was holding it at arm's length, both Corey and the vampire looking at each other in shock at how this was happening. Corey had shown some very peculiar abilities ever since the Fiery Cross mission, but the lieutenant dismissed his feat of strength to a case of heightened adrenaline. Chief, yelled Jake, nodding his head to the television monitor. Right responded Corey, throwing the vampire into the large theatre screen. Sparks and electricity jolted the surprised vampire as it slammed face first into the screen. The creature spun around, taking on the naked form of the Asian girl and pleaded, Oh, you wouldn't... Ah, you tried that one already, said Jake as he and Corey continued unloading on the vampire. The rate of high-velocity bullets, it was absorbing faster than its body could regenerate itself. Now, completely pressed against the ruined television, the vampire threw up its arms and, in a shriek of disbelief, burst into a pillar of flames. Darren had retreated to the kitchen with the vampire he shot chasing after him, while the two other vampires had Paul cornered at the door. Corey snapped off three rounds at one of the vampires and yelled, Paul and I will take these two, sir. Go help Darren. Jake saw the vampire leaping into the kitchen and snapped off two quick shots which blew holes in the wall behind the bloodsucker. Cursing, Jake leaped over the coffee table and ran towards the kitchen while Corey snapped off two more rounds at the vampire's threatening paw. Jake burst into the kitchen then, surprised to see the vampire lying on the ground and choking next to an overturned stainless steel bowl. The vampire was covered in seasoning. Oh, the damn thing knocked over my secret recipe of garlic and herb seasoning I was going to use to make garlic bread and garlic chicken, yelled Darren as he fired his rifle into the creature's face. Oh, motherfucker, that was going to be our breakfast. The lieutenant joined Darren in blasting round after round in the vampire until it, too, unable to regenerate as quickly as it was receiving its wounds, burst into flame. Paul was out of ammo and was having difficulty either reloading his rifle or grabbing his sidearm as he fended off the other two vampires. In a move reminiscent of how Big Paul Gimsby shoulder tackled an obstruction of filing cabinets and desks out of the way at Fiery Cross Reef, Corey shoulder tackled the two vampires just as they were about to lunge at Paul. His surprising momentum knocking them off balance and slamming the two vampires together on the opposite wall with a calamitous thud. Get clear, Chief, yelled Paul as he raised his now reloaded battle rifle and began punching round after round into each vampire. Gaining his feet with rifle in hand, Corey quickly joined in. Having learned that the only way to kill these vampires was to fatally injure them faster than they could heal, Corey flicked the selector lever on his MK-12 battle rifle to burst and emptied his magazine into one vampire before it burst into flame. Paul's heavier hitting 762 quickly produced the same results to the last hapless vampire and it rejoined its compatriot in an impressive, spontaneous combustion. Dude, said Corey, why did you invite them in? Everybody knows that vampires can't enter the house unless you invite them in. How was I supposed to know they were vampires, Chief? 
said Paul. If a bunch of females dressed like sorority school strippers come knocking on your cabin door way out here in the middle of nowhere after midnight, they're vampires. Uh, yeah, good to know, Chief, replied Paul. I'll remember that for next time. Oh, shit, yelled Corey suddenly, seeing that the flames were spreading uncontrollably. Hey, LT, we have a problem here. Darren and Jake ran out of the kitchen. Go grab your gear and shit, ordered Jake. The fire extinguisher isn't putting out the fire. Well, the lieutenant was correct. The foul, putrid-smelling fire would not be extinguished until the dwelling in which the vampires had been invited had burned to the ground. The four men stood outside with their belongings and equipment, helplessly watching as the beautiful cabin went up in flames. Behind them, the driveway lit up from the headlights of a car as an immaculately restored red and white 56 Chevy Bel Air pulled to a stop. An elderly gentleman climbing out of the driver's side, a look of shock on his face. My cabin! Oh, my cabin! Near tears, the piteous old man stared in disbelief at the fiery spectacle before him. He looked to be in his late seventies, and still had a head of thick silver hair and old-fashioned handlebar moustache. Skinny and frail, he wore a brown suit and tie, the same as one might see in the late 1950s sitcom when Ward Cleaver came home to his son's Wally in the Beaver after a long day at work. The elderly gentleman raised his hands to his mouth, trembling in sadness. What happened to my beautiful cabin? What did you people do? Um, I'm sorry, sir. The lieutenant was at a loss for words. There was an accident. My grandfather built this cabin long ago to get away from people and to be with nature. It's been in that family for generations. My grandfather even named this lake. Moon Lake, he called it, because of how beautiful the lake looked when the full moon reflected on the water. Sir, we're really sorry. The old man stepped forwards, now visibly crying as the roof slowly caved under to be consumed by the fire. Ignoring the lieutenant, the old man continued. It's just my wife and I now. Perhaps you'd met her. Runs the local grocery store just outside of town. Oh, she's barren, so we didn't have any kids we could leave the cabin to. We just, well, we just wanted to live out our last days here in peace. Sir, said Darren, we're really sorry it wasn't our fault. These girls came to the door earlier and they just sort of, um, burst into flames, continued Paul. The elderly man fell to his knees, hopelessness on his face as his eyes reflected the funeral pile that was once his beloved cabin. Sir, Jake said again. Did you have insurance? I mean, we'll be happy to help you rebuild. The old man looked up at the Navy lieutenant, his eyes now filled with the reflection of the fire. Rebuild? How can you possibly rebuild what's been destroyed? These foundation stones came all the way from my ancestral home in the Scottish Moors, from the castle my family once owned before we were driven out. <sighs> Who are you people? The elderly man's voice slowly went from grief to rage. Come closer, yeah, you. You're the pack leader, yes? Come on, come here. Jake stared into the man's eyes seemingly unable to focus on anything except the fire reflecting within. Uh, sir, said Corey. Jake took a step closer, his eyes transfixed on those fiery eyes, his mind blank to all else, even as the old man smiled and licked his teeth. Yeah, come closer. The hypnotically soothing voice was in his head as Jake took another step. Sir, what are you doing? said Chief Pretty again, his voice raised in concern. You will be my son. You will be the new pack leader. The old man began to rise to his feet, changing form as he did so. Yes, uh, father. Jake heard himself mumble as he reached out to the werewolf. He was knocked to the ground as Corey tackled him. Darren and Paul unloading on the eight-foot-tall, silver-maned horror that now resembled more wolf than man. Oh, shit, what happened? Jake rolled over, rubbing his chin after his face had hit the ground. 
Corey rolled over, taking one knee and raised his rifle. Just shoot, sir. You can thank me later. The werewolf raised his arms protectively across its head as dozens of rounds impacted into his body. Ah, he was old, and the centuries it had lived through had caught up to the aged hunter. Had he been younger, he might have been able to have leapt forwards towards these men before they could shoot with those powerful weapons which he'd never encountered in his long, violent life. A twinge of panic rose in the werewolf as he realized that he was taking too much damage to retreat even if he wanted to. The panic turned to rage and then horror when the reality struck him that the rapid-fire wounds he was receiving were far outpacing his ability to heal himself. Ah, <sighs> growled the werewolf, clutching at his chest, vainly attempting to stop the blood from gushing like a fountain out of the brutal wounds it had suffered. Do you know fear? Do you not know fear? Do you not quake in terror at those things which haunt the night? What are you that you do not suffer the fear which gives our kind the power and dominion over your souls? Well, we survived Ramadi and Fallujah, said Lieutenant Wolf, his voice a deep growl. And Kabul, sir, said Paul. Don't forget Kabul. Oh, yeah, added the lieutenant. And Kabul. Well, like Gimsby said, we survived Kabul and the Karangal Valley. Oh, I don't think I was with the team when you guys went into the Karenga, said Paul. Really? said Jake. I could have sworn that you were there. Well, you weren't with us when we encountered that thing in the caves. <sighs> Silence, damn you. Silence. Sinking to its knees, blood pouring from its open maw, the werewolf defiantly spat. You, you Navy Seals are assholes before slumping over and plopping on the ground, dead. The rays of the early morning sun rising above the golden lake, beginning to sear its fur. Daddy, said the boy, that's not how you kill a werewolf. Lieutenant Jake Wolf was wearing pajamas and was sitting on his son's bed next to his son, his arms outstretched and hands wide as he was explaining to his five-year-old little boy how he and his SEAL team had defeated the monstrous things which went bump in the night. Lowering his arms and pulling his son close to him, Jake said, Okay then, how do you kill a werewolf, buddy? With a silver bullet, or a silver sword, or a silver knife, replied his son. Well, anything silver, Daddy. Ah, oh, but Daddy and his friends didn't have anything like that, my son. So we had to use what was available at the time. Yeah, sure, it may not have been the ideal thing to have easily defeated the monsters, but believe me, buddy, it worked just as well. That's how you killed those nasty girls without stakes and holy water, Daddy? Damn, how did this little guy get so smart? He must have gotten it from his mother. Oh, they weren't girls, buddy, said Jake. They were vampires. Like liberals, their species has no gender. Jake hugged his son again. Benjamin had been having trouble getting to sleep lately, terrified of the monsters hidden in the darkness. The ones he's seen on Netflix, the campground killers, the demon clowns, that slender man, and the ones he'd heard about in urban legends, the rakes, the frogmen, the bigfoots, the vampires and the werewolves. And they were all coming. They were all coming to kill his daddy, who had pledged his life to defend people against all the monsters that infested the world. It wasn't fair. Why did Daddy always have to leave while everyone else stayed safe and sound in their beds, while his rough Daddy had to go and do violence on their behalf? Why did men like his Daddy have to die fighting monsters? Daddy, said the boy, hugging his father. So you and your men killed all the monsters then? I mean, there are no more monsters left, right? Oh, I'm not saying that at all, my son, said Jake, hugging his son close to him and kissing him on the top of his head. There are monsters in the world, real monsters. Monsters who spread fear and who feed on the helpless and innocent. That's why the world needs strong men like your daddy and his friends. That's why you need to grow up to be smart and kind and brave, always telling the truth, have self-respect and faith in God. Ah, the world will need someone like you one day. A strong man who prays to God and has guns and shit. But how will I know a monster in disguise, daddy? Well, buddy, a monster feeds on fear. 
That's how a master gains power. You'll know that there's a monster when it tries to make you afraid. Okay, Daddy. Well, then I won't be afraid. And the little boy wrapped his arms around his father's arm and finally drifted off to sleep. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I love Taxi Dancer stories so much. You never quite know what you're going to get. Oh, that was lovely, wasn't it? Brilliant, epic kick in some serious monster ass in that one. <laughs> that was a lot of fun to read, and I hope it was a lot of fun for you all to listen to as well. Well, that's it for my uh, Monday evening's entertainment. Back again on Wednesday with uh, something super special, if I get my ass into gear and get it recorded. Um, about two hours, I think it's going to be. Um, if not Wednesday, that will come on Friday, but something good coming on Wednesday, whatever. So I hope you can enjoy me again real soon. Well, till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams. And bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.